Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, uh, uh, maybe the stress may be gone for a little bit for a while. We've got a lot of work to do. we got a lot of work to do. And... Um, and on this show, we've got quite a bit of things to, to talk about. And actually, we're going to talk about the, um, the elections and, and uh, what happened with that piece aspect of it. And, and, and then what mo most important is where will we go from there and where do we go from here? And I think it's very important. And actually, joining me today are folks who have been on the show for quite some time. And they're going, they're going to talk about that. Talk about, uh, they're going to be part and parcel of the, of the, quote, conversation and direction that we're going to go on. You know, Bob and, and you know, John Sweeney here. And, and then after the crew and whatever. But before I get into the, the, the show in these other areas, I want to make some, make maybe just some little short announcements here. Uh, last night, uh, I received an award uh, from uh, the Zeta Sigma Omega Chapter Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Inc. In fact, I've got the award sitting up here on the, on the table here on the chair. And, and basically, it's, uh, it was given to me by, uh, by them in regards to government. There were several categories, and, and just acknowledging the... Uh, uh, the fact that I'd been very much involved in a number of governmental activities, running for all that kind of stuff, but, but in all due respect, uh, a lot of this would not have been would not have come to light had it not been for the show here at PCM, Portland Cable Medium. You know, this is a very and I've been doing this for quite some time, and and then I want to share this award with uh, other folks who have been been a part and parcel of that, and and I've got these guys sitting up here right here with me. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, as you know, I've got, uh, here's, my, here's Tom there, and mm -hmm. there's Tom, Tom out there on the, on the camera, mm -hmm. and there's John, and then there's Bob, and there's folks out there in the, the camera crew and whatever. I'm going to have them come out here very shortly and, and just let you see the see the people who are behind uh, what this show is all about. You think we might be able to get all the guys, get everybody to come on over? At the same time, we're going to be celebrating. The, we got Veterans Day coming out here today, so get, get all get the crew, get a, get everybody to come on out here right now and see you got everybody out here? Just, a, just, a, just, just one flat deal and acknowledge everything. At the same time, I want you to know that this is Veterans Day. You notice I've got my Marine Corps hat on, if you will, cap on. Come on, guys. Let's, let's just get everybody out here real quick. Like, uh, they, 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 just get in front of the camera. I just want to make sure we get all these guys. These, these are the folks that are behind. Tom, are you can, come on over here, Tom. We don't. We got, we got one more sitting up in the deal. Yeah, Jim is Jim, taking care of business. Jim's taking care of here. We're going to creep Jim out. We don't have to pay him for being on camera, do we? <laughs> 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 he won't have to sign the waiver. You've got to pay us. So, so, so when you see me all the time and whatever, these are the guys that are responsible. They give me a script every time I come on the show. So anything that I say, is, it comes from these guys. More or less. Yeah. Actually, yeah. we just follow you and try to keep up. Yeah, right, right, right off the bat. Uh, and you know, right. I, I might, I might add also to um, remember our, our dear friend uh, Larry Dunham. Remember Larry Dunham? Yeah. And Dunham was the one that got me involved in this stuff way back when. Yeah, at Roger Cable out there on Sandy Avenue. That was so long. he's to blame. Yeah, he's to blame. Now you guys are to blame for keeping me around. <laughs> That's it. Right. But guys, thank you very much for being here, and thank you guys for it. Right. Wait, hold on for me. We got one more. We got one more. But the, the, the other thing that we've got to do is that we've got to announce the fact we've got Veterans Day coming up, and we've got a number of veterans, and we've got a good citizen who pays the bank. If you come over here, we got, got all these guys. Uh, uh, I think Air Force. Air Force. Got the Air Force. Got the Army. Army. And you got Dave the Army. Army. And Tom is the Air Army. Air Force. Air, yeah. Air Force. Air Force. Now I'm Marine Corps nasty, but but again, it's happy. It's, hey guys, thanks for serving. We appreciate that, Remember, and thanks for paying. And yeah. <laughs> kiss, kiss Army. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Well, again, this is Veterans Day. Thanks, guys. Okay, all right, all right, all right guys. Happy Veterans Day. Okay, good enough. I want to make sure that uh, we acknowledge both of these situations with the awards and this, that, and the other. It's very important that uh, we do this. Yeah. Okay, I'll put this on the side over here, and let's get down to, to business. And by the way, for Veterans Day, I, I would say to those folks that, uh, you know, I was in doing the draft aspect of it, and I joined the Marine Corps, but uh, the draft was really an asset to, to uh, the military is, is a very positive thing. Yeah. It's unfortunate a lot of our young people don't have access uh, to the military. It and, makes and you grow up. Come, a couple comments? Yeah, I, I agree. I was number 87. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was in school. I I had a, uh, I think it was two S or four S, yeah. uh, and I had to uh, cancel my. Uh, I went to school college for a year, and then I decided to go into the service. Okay. Uh, 
I was I felt like I wasn't uh, doing all I could do. Uh, I know I wasn't being all I could be. And really and truly, it, was, it stopped me from running away from things and made me uh, stand pat and began to do things in a different way. Good. So, Thanks, sir, Bob. Good. John, how about you, John? Well, I joined when I was 16, and so it was a couple of years where I had to sign up for the draft. And, and uh, you know, one of the things about the draft is that there have been a lot of families who have been on uh, welfare for years and years or you know, generations, and suddenly one of them would get, get drafted, and he ends up in in the service and he comes out at the end of his time says well you know I don't have to go back on welfare I got skills I've mm -hmm. got a chance to go to trade school or to college or something and it would get them off well mm -hmm. we don't have that step that you know that snags them to get them off that thing and the thing is about the draft a young guy back in those days had to make a decision was he going to uh, volunteer for the army get it over was he going to find another service to go to was he going to go in a National Guard or Reserve. It was a decision that he and he alone had to make. And if he's going to go to camera to head to Canada, why well, that was another okay. that was a bad choice, but it was a choice. You know, and it's what I recommend to young people today. Register to vote so the politicians will listen to you when you wave that card in front of them. And then for the men is to uh, sign up for the draft. They're not drafting now, but you still have to have to do that. Not doing it uh, Cuts uh, your, some benefits out okay. for you. Thanks for serving, John. Okay, good. Just acknowledge some of the some of the people that I've known for a number of years, and here in the Oregon area aspect of it. I, I, I'm actually going to be celebrating Marine Corps birthday next mm -hmm. week, and I normally go to a luncheon that, that acknowledges that we the Navy puts that on for us. Bumbarita, friend of my guy that I was in the, he was a recruiter. He was a, actually he was a he was a lieutenant in the, in the Navy, and and anyway he puts on this piece uh, every year. And we all kind of get together, basically invite the Marines and whatever. But some of the notable, you'll probably recognize the name, is uh, the voice of the Blazers, Bill Shonley. Oh. Yeah, he's a Marine, and uh, he's with standard of clients. In fact, he's, what he's doing today is that uh, they're going to have one of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen at, uh, at standard in, with, with, at the, at the uh, appliance store there right. aspect of it. You may want to go out and see him. Get an autograph. Was I was with him uh, the other night. Is that right? Well, yes. well, Bill is Bill is a Marine, and and I'm gonna probably I'm gonna see him next week. And another notable, the uh, uh, former mayor, mayor Bud Clark, he, he's a Marine, and and I'll be seeing Bud, and he too will be at the luncheon, and uh, we see one another every year at that piece. And Bud is still alive and kicking, and mm -hmm. whoop whoop, Bob, mm -hmm. remember that? Whoop, whoop. But anyway, I want to make sure. And then you know, there, there's other no, major notables. Uh, there's Judge Answer Haggerty, a federal judge. Oh, yeah. Another Marine, a well decorated Marine, by the way, a very decorated Marine. In fact, uh, uh, Answer was uh, also a, a recruiter back in those days with Judge Blakely and folks like that. And I was a recruiter, that's how I came here. Hmm. And I sort of I replaced sort of a, a gentleman from there. But anyway, I was a recruiter for that. Then there's Colonel, Colonel Bill Jenkins, he's another Marine. And then Bill Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins has been around here for for a number of years. He was in the reserve aspect of it, and um, and I think about him. Then Bob Elliott, who was a senator at one point. Yeah, I remember senator Bob. Elliott. And um, Bob was a he, again. He was in the he was in the, in the military. And in fact, he got me into the uh, National Guard after I got out of the Marine Corps for a while. And got to went to warrant officer and whatever. And then Larry Dunham. Larry Dunham was uh, was in the military uh, for quite some time and. And so these are just some of the notables. There, there are many others that I, that I've known, but uh, but I just thought I'd highlight these guys. And, and as you know, uh, Larry is not with us anymore at this time. In fact, Bob Elliott, I I, I think Bill Bill Jenkins is still kicking. But uh, but again, I want to thank the, all of these folks for for serving. And and hopefully you will acknowledge uh, Veterans Day because without <coughs> without these folks and who have participated, to, we wouldn't be around. You know. And, That's and, right. And so it's very important to. Celebrate, so you may not go to one of the parades or this, that, and the other, whatever. But at least you know, just just think about that. There, there might be people within your own family that served in the military. And acknowledge the fact that they have served and whatever, and do whatever you can for them. Okay, that was Veterans Day. We did the Emerald Award aspect of it. So now let's get down to um, uh, to the elections. As you know, we <clears throat> uh, it's President Elect. Right. Obama, right? Yes. He's going to be here for another four years. And uh, naturally, uh, some folks uh, didn't, didn't feel too comfortable about that. 
some folks re rejoiced about that whole issue aspect of it, and we're going to discuss this, and and I might share a little a little a little history, if you will, about um, about about uh, the election, if you will, of our first African American uh, pr uh, president, if you will, of these United States in the Barack Obama. Uh, and I go back and Bob and I we talked about this before a little bit bit and whatever. Let's talk about our history. I think. Because uh, race is, a, is, as far as I'm concerned, and when you start thinking about various mandates and whatever, right. I think one of the one of the major mandates of uh, uh, of the of the uh, of, of of this election was the issue on race. A lot of times people didn't talk about the issue of race, but it is a, it, it is an issue. You talk about the budget and this, that, and the other, but one of the ones that really just sticks out quite a mm -hmm. bit is the issue of race, and I think it's good. I mean, that's one of the things that, as far as I acknowledge, with uh, with president election. President Obama, at first time around, we now had the issue of race talking about. So we've gone through four years, and it's been talked about, back and forth and sideways and whatever. Bob, well, when we talk when we talk about the issue of race, I I look at what what they say on uh, television. You know, the news, uh, those people that are supposed to be bringing us the news, who's really developing the news for us. And one of the things that they they talk about is is the race and. He wouldn't have been elected if, and then they go, the Latinos had, uh, hadn't voted 73% for him. Blacks hadn't have voted 93% for him. Then they kind of hide it in, in somewhere in the conversation that uh, he also got the female vote, uh, you know, which is in, in, uh, from, the, from the, uh, white, the white female vote. And my thing is, that at some point we have to say about race is that it's holding us back. Every time, uh, you know, uh, it, it continues to be that elephant in the room. Uh, when you, it, they want to, uh, why would you want to stop someone from being all they can be just because they are black or brown or even uh, poor white? You know, we, have, we in America have to get over that and and we have to have that dialogue and that's the thing that that doesn't happen is that no one wants to really talk about it because they don't want to offend you know uh, you're not pc uh, and so we have to uh we have to just say you know we're going to take the cloak off of this and we're going to call it what it is is why would you waste your time being hateful or uh, showing bigotry among uh, against someone simply because of who they sleep with, who what color they are, or how they vote. But the color is really the issue. And the, the black color, and the white. The, that, that's the major da, piece. Da, da. I mean, there might be all these other components, but the, the the fact that the black and white thing is a is a major piece yes. aspect of it. And I and I throw another piece out real quick, like to you, and then I get to John. Is that uh, uh, now what what would have happened? Would we still be on the subject of race? I'd say yes, had Governor Romney won. Without a doubt, because uh, black, black people felt that they would have been, they would have been uh, put aside. Or thrown under the bus, is yes. what you're saying? Yes, some people say thrown under the bus, I say put aside. But we still would have had the discussion, but the, right? It wouldn't have been a discussion. Oh, is that right? Okay. No. Okay. It wouldn't have been a discussion on race because uh, you don't have enough money to force a discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's the thing, but now, you know, in his last four years, I hope with all my heart that President Obama will say, let's talk about race. Mm -hmm. You know, let's get let's get an understanding that there's that there are people that don't look like you, but they are like you. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the important part. Okay. All right. John, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> one thing uh, I hope that uh, President Obama remembers that. The wind wasn't that great, so it wasn't a landslide mandate. But uh, he has a program that he uh, wants to put forward, and there's a lot of good features on it. And mentioning the press and the fact that they soft soap a lot of things, and they didn't cover a lot of things. They didn't co bring up and talk about race much. They didn't. They almost avoided the immigration issue. And I have some Republican friends, and uh, they didn't vote for Romney because they felt that uh, Paul Ryan, Ryan was just really too extreme. And I think that's probably what killed him, is the fact there weren't that many Republicans that went 
fully that way because of Paul Ryan. Mm -hmm. But again, getting back to race, I'd really like to get your feel for the whole issue, the but, black but, and white yeah, thing. But they, what, what is that piece? They, How, they've that been in, uh, avoiding that, and and they don't want to discuss. Has this that. helped in his last four years in terms of talking about this issue of race? I think so, because then the thing is, you've seen people uh, get up that that uh, are able to do things and that they have abilities and all that. Of course, one of the things is that when um, a black trips up, they seem to just really smear it across the mm -hmm. front of the, the press. And I find that unfortunate because white people have made the same mistake or, or a bigger mistake and haven't had the uh, press. So it's mm -hmm. the, the race thing is there and it's kind of, it's, uh, you know, like with the press, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and something about uh, the, the race is doing wrong, that's, that's a close second or third behind it. So it's just something you always have to bear in mind. And um, I am fortunate in a way that uh, when I was young, I was in Giles Lake, and I went to Giles Lake grade school, and, and it was about 40% uh, black students. So I was sitting in class, and, you know, hey, we, we're sitting next to you know, each other in class and doing things in class. And, and um, then some of them, you know, they uh, moved to different parts of town. And, uh, you know, in 1967, 68, I was in the MPs, and there was a, the riot over there. And I really didn't look forward to going over and shooting up my friend's house. The riot where? In Portland. Okay. And, uh, but the, the thing is that, and they've actually been spread, and Bob said several times, really, is there a black community left because it's been so spread. But the deal is, when it comes to race, it seems like, they bring it up a little bit, and then they, they withdraw it. They don't fully discuss it. So now we will you know, be now we will be discussing it again, yeah. a little bit more of an emphasis, right? You know, right. something is, uh, on Wednesday night uh, when Tuskegee Airmen was in town, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, uh, I think it's Alexander uh, Jefferson. Yeah, he'll be there. That's the same guy's going to be a okay. standard standard appliance. And I talked with him, and he talked to to the crowd, and let me, and he was talking about fighting in the war being captured, spending his time in, in a concentration camp, and then coming over, coming back home after being uh, liberated and coming back home and getting off the boat. And some, and it, here's the way he said it. This white guy was standing at the, at, the at the bottom of the stairs and told me, move over, boy. You know, now here's a guy that just put his life on the line for this country, and he's treated with decency in prison. But when he gets back home, the color of his skin determines whether or not he's a man or a boy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what that's what we have to get over. You know, we have to stop looking at people by uh, and do what Dr. Martin Luther King said: the content of their heart, not the color of their skin. Well, yeah. on on that part there is when they came off the ship, the uh, and the pilots were officers, and they were put with the enlisted people, not with the white officers. Mm -hmm. Well, and you that know, was a disgrace. you know, on that same note, there are a couple of movies out there that uh, I would recommend that look, look to kind of help <laughs> us out through this whole piece. One is the movie Glory, mm -hmm. with, with Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Right, excellent movie, by the way. It talks about uh, those days during the Civil War, if you will, and. Uh, and in fact, that's where the Buffalo Soldiers had started out that whole issue aspect of it. And uh, I thought that would be a good one. And the other one was the um, the other movie was the the one with the Tuskegee Airmen. What was the name? Uh, Red it? Tail. Red Tail. Yeah, and he, I asked movie. him about that. He said, "Excellent movie, by the way. You said, might want to. I recommend." Yeah, it he said they they kind of uh, exaggerated some points in there mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they were talking about. I think his name was Chappie. Yeah, Chappie uh, James. And they were saying that. Uh, you know, he's he's he flew over over a hundred missions. Could you imagine him uh, flying those missions <coughs> drunk? You know, and they showed him as a drunkard or something that in the movie. He was really upset about it. Uh, but that he told, me, but he did. You know, I told him. I said, "Well, I have to see it, you know, so that I can make yes, my own judgment." Yes, it must see. It'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be a good. It would be a good thing to right. look at. There now, was a one before on that. that note, uh, there was one before what, that. What that? Tusky Gear ran with. Um, uh, Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr. Yeah, and it was a much better, yeah, uh, and a more complete and a more accurate uh, uh, film about about the thing. Right. The only problem is that it should have been about an hour longer, mm -hmm. 
because now, they... the same one? Uh, no, that's a different no, no, this one. Is before. One, one, but now, they were the producers of the Red Tail. Uh, Cooper, Cooper Jr., yeah, yeah, and yeah. his brother. But the, one, but the one before was more accurate, wasn't spectacular, had a lot of revealing facts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I said it should have been an hour longer, because I'm an aviation fan, they flew more different types of aircraft than any other unit there. Right. And the fact that you are, uh, say, if, if you're in car racing and then you try truck racing mm -hmm. and you have a chance to try it, well, they jumped in a different kind of plane in combat mm -hmm. and the, the characteristics are entirely different. You know, it's mm -hmm. like going from a Tommy gun to a machine gun. There's a, there's a okay. big difference. Okay. Well, you know, on that particular point, I'm, I'm bringing the point up, the fact that man, these movies are out there. Right. And it's kind of like an educational kind of a deal. And I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, I think we need to do more of today is to educate educate uh, the population, if you will. And the way you can do that, when one of naturally the only, the only way during those formative years is actually through our education system, right. and that's not part of the education system. That's one of the major problems we have, is that we don't, we, we've not, we've not spent enough time in that part of the of our history, as far as our history. You know, I'm thinking about when we were going to school, mm -hmm. and when you were going to school, John. Uh, there, there's a there's some major history there, uh, and I'll share something with you just in a layman's term, and I, and I'll challenge you to go out there and and follow up on that history. Uh, when you think about this country, when we first uh, when it first arrived, if you will, uh, we all hear about the slaves uh, uh, coming here from this country, from to, from Africa to, to the United States to America, if you will, and a lot of folks don't realize that uh, African chiefs were the one that sold slaves that's right. to the trade trade slavers, and that's how they got here. And uh, and then on the on the white there were white slaves too. And they the way called, the whites, but they called them indentures. They, they called them slaves. indentures, and their job yeah. was to come down here and and work the land and whatever, and send all of the goods back uh, back to to Europe, if you will. And so I contend, and, and there's, there's a lot of history there. It's just a matter of just it, it just wasn't shared. But the idea is that I think those two entities, the indentured servants, and also the uh, the slaves, mm -hmm. the African slaves, became. Uh, black Americans mm -hmm. and white Americans. That's right. And when they had the Revolutionary War for America, if you will, uh, blacks, black Americans, and white Americans fought side by side. That's and right. you need to know that this, this is history. <clears throat> this is documented. And the first shot that was fired, the first round that was shot against, if you will, the the entities of the British or whatever, right. the, the Red Coats and whatever, Christmas was Saturday. fired by. A black American. Yeah. A lot of folks don't realize that. Very, very important. That history is there, folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as you know, a couple of times I've shown that. Then, then you move this that piece up to Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln ran, if you will. That was his mandate. One of the major mandate was the issue of race. Right. And uh, he basically imagine if he had been living the day, had he lived and not been shot, if you will, uh, I think we wouldn't be talking about this issue. They would be voting because mm -hmm. people would have been all. Americans, if you will, some of which who happen to have been black, white, Asian, uh, I mean, his, his Mexican, whatever, the whole yeah. line. But the bottom line is that the history is there, and that should go into the schools. Because otherwise, you can't get around that piece. And a lot of us, because if you don't have the knowledge, if you're the majority, you tend to want to say, well, look, I'm the only one that exists, and I should run. Yes. Fair? It's a life is good. But the truth, the truth of the matter is, we're, this country was, was built on capitalism. And yeah, good point. slave trade was a commodity, and you traded that. For both sides. For both sides. Black and white. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and uh, it didn't matter. It was about the money. And so, and it was about getting the goods to market. And, and, and so when you, when you look at what, what went on in this country, People don't realize that white men couldn't vote when, when, uh, at one point. You had to own property in order to vote in this country. So if you were a white man without property, you couldn't vote. No. Uh, if you were a white woman, you could not vote. They had to have the woman's suffrage, or not. whether you had owned property or not. As a white Matter man. of fact, uh, it was at one time a woman couldn't own property in this country. I mean, we need we need to go back and look at the history so we won't is continue there? to repeat is it. There? Is there? You know, and then maybe we'll stop treating people like something other than like chattel rather than human beings. You know, point, well, not trying to 
but the electoral college that was all based on that whole issue of, of property if right. you will, in many ways so they, they're the one that basically made the decision yes. but but again it comes to education and i think our education system and hopefully the president at, at one of his mandate would be that of education mm -hmm. which is a very key piece that because uh, i noticed that in, in the state of texas is i understand they wanted to kind of they wanted to forget, if you will, a certain aspect of history uh, here in this country, and, and they, they, they fought at that in, in, in Texas and whatever. But we need to go back and educate. It's going to be hard for our elders, if you will, you know, folks oh, yeah. who are over certain ages to kind of recognize. They just didn't get the, the education. People. Well, the thing in America is <clears throat> that we like to talk about history and maintain it, and they feel that certain things uh, we would lose our historical value if we change certain things. Like November the 6th or the first month, a Saturday, a, a Tuesday in November for elections. You know, people don't understand how that came about. Mm -hmm. You know, that was because of the farmers. And when they could get their crops to market or their or whatever they were getting to market and they would be in the area, and all those things was done based on livability. Mm -hmm. and, and today, with all, uh, we can go to a computer and, and vote if we really wanted to, mm -hmm. but it would take some money out of somebody's pocket, and so we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, and so those are the things that we have to understand. And not only that, but it also gives you an opportunity not to, uh, to try and stop or say things that will stop minorities and others from voting. Mm -hmm. You know, you it's know? Kinda, it, it, I, like, I like what you said, because the other thing is that uh, when you think about that electoral college, that was an issue from the standpoint of saying, well, uh, from, from certain areas uh, within um, during this election period, we need to get rid of the, the, the point was that we need to get rid of the electoral college right. because they felt that in this particular case, uh, uh, they said, well, he's going to get the electoral votes. Right. And you ask yourself the question, well, who are these voters? Uh, these are not black Americans. These are white Americans in all due respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's very few a part of that electoral college aspect of it. It wasn't designed that way. But if they do get rid of it, 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 it there's a strong case to making it a popular vote aspect of it. Right. That's going to be a very interesting aspect. Of it's it. going to be it's going to be very interesting, but I don't think it's going to it's going to happen so. anytime so soon. So, uh, although there's a possibility because you look at it, and when you look at the map and it said red states yeah, yeah, and yeah, blue yeah, states, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not well, populated in many ways. The red states are low populated states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and you have to know your history to understand that the most of them are southern states right. or people that left those southern states after slavery mm -hmm. and moved to the uh, moved up north or mm -hmm. north west mm -hmm. and and uh, and north, mm -hmm. like the Dakotas and all of that, to get away from what was going on in the lower forty eight in the lower twelve you know, states. So, like so I said, we, we're still kind of like in that mindset. But again, with this extra yeah. four years, talking to the issue of race, I think is a very important piece. And that, uh, again, going back to that Civil War aspect of it, uh, a lot of folks don't realize that right. uh, during that particular time, there was some 350,000 uh, black Americans that mm -hmm. fought in that Civil War aspect right. of it. And the, the 40 acres and a mule aspect of it was, was mm -hmm. very, very important at that point in time. And and it was okay until it got to the point that at the end of the war and, and President Lincoln said, well, okay, fine, the black Americans are going to get the same attributes as, uh, as, as white Americans, if you will, the folks who fought. But unfortunately, they changed the rules. Oh, yeah. They changed the rules. And I think that needs to be corrected. I mean, that, that's a lot of history there. Yeah. And a lot of folks participated, if you will, in that piece. A lot of folks don't understand the, um, the participation of Mexican Americans that participated. Or Chinese Americans. Chinese Americans. <laughs> we wouldn't have a railroad, yeah, would yeah, we? Yeah. So, so there's a lot, a lot of things that are going. And I think it's very important that we get back to this. Somebody needs to sit down at the education system and kind of let's see what we can do to, to, to bring that up to air, if you will. Okay. But you when, we, but when we do it for today, uh, you know, what, right quick, one of the things for we today, uh, we should we should look at how do we get our children educated. Well, that's key. The education system. We'll okay, fine. That. What we're going to do, we're going to take a short break, folks, and then we're going to come back and continue this discussion. And we, we're going to probably open up the lines if we have an opportunity. Dave, if, if we can open up the lines, maybe folks might want to participate uh, in our discussion. Again, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. People should be talking about these issues because in all due respect, at the end of this four years, I would hopefully we'll all be Americans, if you will, and we, we got tough fights. We've got to work together, and we've got to really, really work together. Okay, we'll take a short break, and we'll be right back.
You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Back, folks, we're back here at the Oregon Voters Digest, and uh, as you can see, we've been having the discussion at the front front end of the show. And uh, again, we're going to try to open up the line. And and again, like I said, even though you, you, you we, we may you may not be able to get to the table and get your yeah, getting into the full discussion aspect of it, get some of your neighbors together. You know, uh, you get some of the folks. I mean, whether you one way or the other, you got neighbors. You know, white neighbors talking to yeah. black folks, black folks talking to white folks. And, Hispanics talking to Hispanics, Asians talking. I mean, just sit down and have a discussion. Because in all due respect, this is a major mandate, if you will, the issue of race. It wasn't talked about as much. Uh, it was mostly talked about on the outside, if you will. Because right. the political thing is a whole different ballgame. They have their own problems, if you will. But this particular four-year period aspect of it, hopefully we will spend enough time and educate ourselves about the benefits of all of us here in America and this becomes America at the end of the at the end of this term, and then from that point on, opportunities will will go for for president will go to those individuals that's going to be of a benefit to us, and uh, and something that some folks will contribute, if you will, to our way of life. So with that, okay. Now we we uh, as part and parcel of uh, of our commitment, if you will, towards that education piece, and to our future. We've got we've got this young man here that we, we support quite a bit, and the, the young Cameron here. Cameron has been, uh, as you know, he's been very active in the politics thing. I, I have, Bob's has, and and uh, I'm really excited about the fact that he's there, he's out there. Uh, and when I first saw him, he, he was running for mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was very excited about the fact that that's what it takes. It takes activism. It takes a whole new breed today mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a new power for our, if you will, to be able to get out there and and actively get involved. So it takes the shirt off your back. It, it takes a, quite a bit. In fact, he, you can see him as he's dressed today, or nearly <laughs> in, in, a, in a new yeah. uniform. But he's out yeah. there. He's out there occupying right now. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk to him about that piece. But but it's a whole new day, folks. You know, That's our it. young people, a whole new day. And uh, I, but I'm so excited about the fact that he's out there. He's involved, et cetera. And in this his recent, uh, besides the mayor piece, he ran for uh, uh, state treasurer. And again, uh, he did real well. He did well. I thought it was about 20-some thousand votes. 36,000 votes. 36,000 votes he wow. pulled out of that piece aspect of it. And that, that was I called all my friends, by the way. That's, that's, Thank that's, you, that's how you're able to get that. Oh, okay. These <laughs> <laughs> friends are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but uh, congratulations on that Thank piece. You. He did real well. And then I guess the, and then we'll just talk about some of the things, the other things that you've been involved in and uh, uh, the whole issue with Occupy. We want to know a little bit more about that because you were right, you were out there with him. In fact, you're out there with him today. In fact, for that matter, and uh, your your issue and uh, your fasting at uh, downtown, mm -hmm. down in the front of city hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not it's nothing. It, it's like saying some way it's not so major. You're not uh, you're not doing a, the the city and if you will down in northeast Portland. Yeah. I mean, you're out there with the people across the board, and you've got issues and whatever. So we're going to let you talk. And we're going to start off with the first off. Let's talk about the the mayor. There, just kind of bring folks up to okay. date in terms of, 
you know, uh, talk a little bit about your past, how you got here, how you got involved, and then how you be, how you got involved in the mayorship, how you filed to run for office in the mayorship, mm -hmm. and then some of the other pieces, you know, for instance, then you got involved with the, uh, the Occupy, you know, that what was that all about, and how, how, did, how did you really got engaged in that peace aspect of it, and define Occupy. So anyway, we got a lot to think. If you forget anything, we'll, Bob and I will interrupt, okay? So let's start, off with, let's start off with Cameron. How'd you get here? How'd you get to Portland? You get to Portland? Yes. So I've been a resident for the past three years. Okay. I come from what I like to call the up-down, which okay. is Virginia. All right. Hi, Mom. And yeah. I've, I came out here because of my family. They also live on the East Coast. So okay. I just took a little walk. I went out for you know, a pack of cigarettes, and I've just been here you know, sipping on kombucha and riding my bike ever since. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you got that bike out there now. Yes, my bike is out there. Yeah, it's like raining. And it's raining. It's it's raining. raining. Well, Bob and I couldn't do that now. <laughs> right, Bob? I think it's <laughs> nice weather right now. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> so how'd you, how'd you start? How'd you get involved? How did you, what was your first year? How, how did how did that's Cameron get involved? involved? With what? what made you get involved <laughs> in the politics of in, what the, we in the political arena? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've been civically active. I would that say means. since I first got to Portland. I would say you know politically is a little different. I haven't really been a policy advocate until you know just about a year ago, <laughs> and that was basically my transition from coming. Uh, you know, civic volunteer, civic volunteer. And activist. Like how? Like what? What were your first involvement? I was involved with a lot of different nonprofits back in the day, including Goose Hollow Family Shelter, okay. Meals on Wheels, Food Not Bombs. In other words, right around Portland. Mm -hmm. So definitely providing a lot of you know hands-on help with a lot of these nonprofits that do a lot of direct work with people at the grassroots level. You were going to school during that time too. Yes. Right? And you, you you were at Portland State. Portland Community College. Portland Community College. Yeah. Okay, and you were getting involved there too, I take it, huh? I was involved with classes there, I and gotcha. I yeah. definitely knew some people in student government, but definitely I was working on a more holistic region of okay. Portland. Okay. So, you know, okay. whether it was in Southeast, Southwest, definitely trying to really have some kind of presence in the community. In the mayor thing, how did that get in there? How, how did you... So that was during my transition. Your transition, when I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When I you know, got involved with the Occupy movement. Okay. And I remember going on the very first march. I never had any intention of actually sleeping there. And I remember the very first night, uh, I was hanging out with some kids I knew from school. I actually went to the birthday anniversary for In Other Words. And I was on my way back home in North of a Portland on William Street, and I was like, you know, I read some really cool people that are still at that park. I should go tell them good night. That's the Occupy. Yeah. They were doing yes, downtown. Yes. Okay. And started talking to them again, and they were just like, hey, you know, everybody is just gonna, you know, chill out for the rest of the night. It's a great night. It's not raining. You just like come sleep with us, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just sat out there under the stars mm -hmm. for that night, and the very next day, I went to a friend's house, borrowed a tent, plopped it in the park, and that's how it all just began, just what, like that. <laughs> what were some of the what were some of the conversation and discussions that were happening in the, in the Occupy during that particular time that you were familiar with? That? I was really at that point getting to know people. Okay. Uh, when Occupy first started, you know, the revelry of it was all these people already knew that they had a similar resonance about what they felt was wrong with the world and what they wanted to do to change it. So at this point, it was just really just like the icebreaker. And that was like the great first two weeks. It was the icebreaker. We're all like, who are you? What's your name? What's your passion? And then after that, a lot of people started mobilizing. And that's when we had general assemblies that were really starting to branch out into people's separate issues. A lot of people, they wanted to do like anti-war demonstrations. Some people wanted to focus on the banks and income inequality. So they definitely started being a lot of division at that point. But in the beginning, it was just really good to see the community and really attach as best as possible. Mm -hmm. On the race issue, I'm just, I'm just going to ask you this question. The race issue. If all of a sudden, if you think uh, the Occupy would have would have been been allowed, if you will, to, to have been able to camp over there, if this was a black group of folks predominantly, would that have happened? <laughs> I well, am going what to what trust what other people have said to me. Okay, go And on. most have said that would not have been allowed. Okay. They, a lot of people that I've talking to, spoken to in the black community <coughs> have told me the reservations of even going down there with a bunch of white people saying okay. that 
just because they're a person of color, they just feel like it would be an unsafe space. Mm -hmm. And knowing that if it was the other way around, mm -hmm. they would not have had that same privilege to be there. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm not sure exactly how right. true that is in the right. contemporary times, mm -hmm. Occupy really helped me open my eyes to the racism that was in Portland. I came from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more established there. I actually grew up in a white neighborhood. So it was a little harder for me to really understand the power dynamics of race here. Mm -hmm. But then when I first came to the parks, there was a handful of us, maybe a half dozen, maybe 10 people of color. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time the camps were finally broken up, there was like four, there was like three. Mm -hmm. And when I had tried to have that conversation about race, because mm -hmm. it was like, obviously it's in, you know, in front of my eyes. Right. And then most people move, they're like, we don't see color. No, like, nothing's happening, let's mm -hmm. change the subject, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to realize there were a lot of problems when it came to talking about inclusivity within mm -hmm. the movement. Mm -hmm. Not the mayor's race, talk about the mayor's race. You got involved with the mayor's okay. race. Okay. Well, that- Why'd you file? <laughs> that was also, you know, just a very fortunate incident. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very involved down there in the parks and the reason why there was an eviction was because of a person who, you know, threw off a Molotov cocktail at the World Trade Center. I actually was there for that, you know, event and seeing it firsthand and seeing how there was a potential for me to be viewed as an accomplice because the person came up to me, actually followed me to where I was at. You know, the with, person threw the you know, huh? Yes. Okay. And so he had asked me for a cigarette from the cameras. Luckily, I don't smoke, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that I'd probably be behind bars right now if I had given him anything. Okay. And mm -hmm. it was very frustrating for me to see the deteriorating relationship between the mayor and some of the organizers in the encampment. And there was a lot of things that we could have done to maintain a safe place, but you know, the mayor decided to you know, minimalize the issue to what's happening already in this city where, you know, there's crime, there's mental health issues, there's homelessness. And, you know, the way that I viewed it, and a lot of activists, a lot of people who are part of the nonprofit community saw this and they were like, this is an opportune time when all these people that we've been trying to get services to mm -hmm. are actually outside, you know, the doorstep of City Hall, we can help them. But, you know, the easier path for the city is to just break it up and make sure it's in smaller spots so, so people have to see so it. So someone approached the, you to file, is that right? No, no. so you know. the Monday after the eviction, we actually were outside of City Hall. Uh, I had organized a demonstration called Occupy City Hall. We okay. were gonna go to the mayor's office and we were gonna complain about uh, everything that happened mm -hmm. the, night, the two nights before. And the entire building was on lockdown. So at that point, we were just sitting around, we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And there was another mayoral candidate named Lauren Parks who was actually outside of City Hall. And he said he was curious about what was going on, and he told me he was running for mayor. And then that's how we got into a conversation. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what led me to, you know, put my Why name not? in for yeah. mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, Bob, you are? Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, you know, as you were talking about uh, helping, uh, helping people, do you have any understanding as to why the mayor did what he did? Because he, uh, did he, do you think he felt that he was helping people, i.e. the business people, uh, by removing you guys, or did you, did you feel that it was just a, you were a blight in the eyesight of the, the powers to be, and therefore you needed to be moved? How, how did you guys look at that? I would say that it was definitely a combination of things. And I won't say that business wasn't being hindered by this presence of people, mm -hmm. but the way I still evaluate it is there's still this bigger issue which instead of being in one, you know, easier to handle pie, it's kind of just parceled out across the area. And now every person in the business community might have some complaints that they are trying to deal with. Um, so I would say particularly that there were many advocates who have been working on this issue for a very long time who came down there they volunteered in the kitchen, they brought mm -hmm. food, and I know a lot of people who actually were going out to try to talk to the traditional social service agencies to bring them down there. Mm -hmm. And at the time when we were really starting to create a strong partnership, that's when you know, the mayor came in, evaluated the situation, decided to act without 
trying to effectively communicate with hmm. what was happening at the grassroots level. Well, my question then would be, how how can you justify taking over a public park and and moving the citizens that would use that park out and you take it over to live in? And I'm, I'm asking these yeah, questions, okay, you know, okay. uh, yeah. yeah, I'm being the devil's advocate right it's now. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. Well, first thing I would say that it never became a private area you know, once people moved in, it was always a public space. Sidewalks are always free. People were always free to come and go. Um, you know, especially for me, I felt like that mm. was a little, a little bit too much freedom. There wasn't enough control in the space. It became a very interesting, you know, um, experiment that was going on. But the mayor completely endorsed it in the beginning, and the police were there, even though they didn't do any enforcement. And so mm. that was another huge problem where they. There was a lot of messaging about how much, you know, the costs were because of policing, even though what the police is used for wasn't optimally engaged upon in the encampment. You know, you could they there was a lot of you know written reports about drug use or harassment and violent right. threats and whatnot, and they would just catalog these things. They wouldn't actually enforce the law, which was a huge frustration to a lot of people who wanted there to be, you know, this agreement, because that's what it was. It was an established understanding where the mayor said, this is a new demonstration. I have absolutely no agenda for you. And by the way, here's some police. So they're going to make sure that the peace gets maintained. Mm-hmm. But that agreement was not respected. It's allowed. It was allowed. Okay, let's move on to this other, another piece. We got, we don't, we got another yeah, thing we want to ask right. you. The other thing is that what about the Occupy deal for the homeless piece? You, you, you put that piece together. Are you talking about the hunger strike? The hunger strike. I'm okay. The hunger strike. So that you happened it after the mayoral campaign. Right, the mayoral campaign. And at that point, you know, it was a little discouraging time for me, seeing that only about 38% of registered voters actually participated in the primary, and just looking at the millions of dollars that every candidate put into it, looking mm-hmm. at the thousands of volunteers that were engaged, and it just seemed that there was still just so much apathy from the community, you know, about you know, getting the things that are important changed. And you know, I was really moved by a lot of the vulnerability that was in the community and seeing a group of activists that have still been working very hard to address the crisis that we're dealing with as, you know, a society. And that was Right to Dream too. And I had a lot of relationship with them because they were established about the same time that the parks had been, you know, in, you know, camped on by the Occupy movement. Mm-hmm. And so I went to them and I said, well, how can I help? And I, you know, volunteered to do a hunger strike. And I, you know, said to them, we, sh- we need to work together to see uh, how we can use this new visibility to make sure that you guys get what you need. Mm-hmm. And what they wanted was to get the fines removed off of Right to Dream 2. Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty much what had me okay. started. Okay, okay. Now let's go back to that. Let's go to another, the other area that you get. Now the, the other issue about Occupy, you know, there was all the issue about the real estate aspect of it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, I think there was a, there was an, there was an African American woman, I guess, that was, uh, that her house was about ready to get taken. Or something. Oh, you're talking about Mayday? Yeah, yes. Mayday. What there's about a few that of those. Mayday? What's that piece? There's a few of those examples. There's Angela Hill. She right. is a organizer with Groundworks Portland. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there's uh, Alicia Jackson who is a flagger for the city of Portland. She's a veteran. And then there was Patricia Williams, or Patricia Johnson, who uh, used to work. She just actually got you know, evicted out of her home after people moved her in. And she was out in Southeast. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, she has pulmonary cancer, I believe. Wow. And so that's the reason why she lost her job. And then the banks refused to help her with her loan. And there have been a few other examples of Annette, Annette Steele, also, she is a 70-year-old grandmother, I believe, mm-hmm. who also had problems with financing her loan, and then they moved her in as well. So there's a lot of examples of people who are mostly in the black community, but there are other people who are receiving help now that are trying to take the banks to court for what they believe is an unlawful foreclosure process. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been a lot in the news about the MERS system. There was even an example where there was like Bain versus the MERS system in Washington saying that, well, we have this huge cloud that nobody actually knows what it is, but it has all of this unilateral power to <laughs> foreclose on people without a, you know, a, yes. a court, a constitutionally court protected you know, process. And so 
Uh, a lot of this is happening here in Portland, and there are many activists who feel like the legislative process is not giving them the results that they need. You know, a lot c considering campaign finance reform, considering the problems with lobbying, considering you know the amount of public outrage that needs to happen to create movement within each le representative. So they decided to put upon themselves to help these people get back into their homes while they're still fighting in the courts about you know their foreclosure issues. And so that's what happened on May Day. Started with Alicia Jackson, okay. and uh, they're going to continue, you know, doing that. Yeah. So far, they're called the Black Working Group, the okay. Occupy Northeast. Okay. Now let's go on with the other piece real quick, because we're going to get some phones real quick. Oh, okay. What about uh, now? Now you're filing for treasurer, state treasurer. I had yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you had. Okay. How'd you get in? There? How, how'd you get in that? Why did you get in there? That was after the hunger strike ended, and I was actually approached by the Oregon Progressive Party, yeah. and they actually had supported me and endorsed me during the a mayoral campaign. Mm -hmm. And you know they were talking about you know their need for statewide candidates. Mm -hmm. You know considering that the way that you know the Secretary of State you know you know organizes minor parties, you have to have one percent of the statewide vote in order to remain in, you know in your charter as a minor party. And so I agreed to you know be their candidate for treasurer. Mm -hmm. And my condition was you know I want to talk about this one policy that I believe is. The, mo the thing that I'm most knowledgeable about, the thing I'm most comfortable talking to people yeah, about, okay. uh, systemically what I feel is going to be the most beneficial change to the Oregon Treasury system okay. for all of our residents, and that was the State Bank of Oregon. It wasn't the State Bank of State Oregon? State Bank of Oregon. And what does that, what, what, how do you define that? So there's only one example of a, a, a publicly owned bank in all of our country. The Federal Reserve is not publicly owned, just no. in case people, you know, a lot of people, you know, have that mistake, but it's not, it's a very weird hybrid of public-private, but 40% of all of the world's banks are publicly owned. Mm -hmm. Examples are in China, Japan, Australia, we have one example in the United States, which is in North Dakota. They've had the Bank of North Dakota for almost a century now, it started in 1919, and it's a really interesting public utility, because it doesn't create a monopoly over the financial sector. Actually, financial sectors are, you know, pretty, you know, vibrant within, you know, these areas that have a publicly bank a public banking authority. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it looks at the state's revenue and it's the state's storage of funds and tries to leverage it for its maximum benefit for the public. Right now we have to negotiate very hard with banks to make sure that our money is working in the best interest of Oregonians. We can do the same thing better, and this doesn't do anything to regulate the private sector. It allows the private sector to be its own separate entity, but it allows the public sector to optimize its ability. Kind of like uh, credit unions used to be. Is that, is that, is that, am I right? There? In a way, it, it's yeah. a, very similar to credit unions, yeah. considering that they have very strong charters. They don't they're, they're nonprofits mm -hmm. and so they are owned by the people in the communities and it's purely for the benefit of mm -hmm. the shareholders right so it's very similar but it's got it's much bigger so yeah. it changes its role completely because the with that amount of revenue you can actually influence monetary policy mm -hmm. and so credit unions they are definitely good for very small you know identified communities but with the state bank it allows us to, the main thing that I really liked about the state bank was it was able to work with city and county governments and give them debt-free bonds. If you wanted to, you know, build a school, fix a road, instead of having to go into debt, you know, either with taxpayers or either with a big bank, you can actually go to the state bank and say, we need $100 million, we'll pay it in this time, and any revenue that the state bank gets from that transaction it can go back to the general fund right. and it creates accountability and it creates an incentive for us to continue paying our loans but it makes sure that all the profits stay inside the state and are used for economic development okay we'll do a quick right because i want to ask you we'll get back onto the national deal but the other thing is that in regards to ted wheeler our present state treasurer uh one were you able to meet with him did you ever met meet with him and did you discuss this issue with him that's one thing secondly did the media uh, he sat down with you and discussed this issue and get it out there. And how did it compare with your running for state treasurer as opposed to running for mayor? Well, you know, the timeline for my treasurer campaign was much smaller. It was probably like three months compared yeah. to about the five months that I ran for mm -hmm. mayor. Right. But each one of these campaigns, they're not, you know, 
the usual amount of time that people are right. on the campaign trail. And so I'm really grateful for the amount of visibility that the media has given for each one of these campaigns. You know, it took a long time. You were in the voters' pamphlet, too. I yes, I was yeah. in the voters' pamphlet. It took a long time for the media to get involved with the mayoral race. Mm -hmm. They did uh, the Tribune and the Mercury and the Oregonian covered it when I first started running. Mm -hmm. And then it, there was like a two-month, you know, cover I mean, and then they started covering it and then for the treasurer campaign oregonian did a really good job opb was involved mercury gave me a shout out during their endorsements so there was a lot of visibility there and i really appreciate that okay yeah, real, real quick let let's, ask, get, let's, can, go, let's get back to the national we okay. only have two minutes yeah, I want to ask, no we got two minutes yeah i'm not on this i just want to ask him on the national side yeah how do we get black people involved in what okay. you're doing okay. sure. and how do we get them involved in the political arena yeah good, as a whole? good question bro. A lot of it has to do with we need more black leaders. I think that's probably one of the most important things. Um, I currently intern at the Urban League, and a lot of my work is about engaging the community. I do phone banking. I help with the social media, community workshops. And I would have to say that we just have to recognize that we still have an identity that we need to you know, unite behind. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of that has been lost considering, uh, you know, the mass amounts of diversity, the mass amounts of different messaging. But I believe that as long as we continue to stay true to our identity, uh, we will have a strong We won't have force. you on again. But yeah. what, what was your reaction to the presidential election, the results of the election? I wasn't like surprised. I was paying attention to Nate Silver. He said, like, 90% chance that Obama was going to get reelected. Um, so I Is it know, a good wasn't thing? concerned. Very good thing. Okay. I voted for Obama. Um, I was mostly satisfied with everything that happened in the national elections. They passed marriage equality in Washington and Maryland. They even ended prohibition in, Cal or in Colorado and in Washington. The only thing that I was really disappointed about in this electoral cycle was what happened in Clackamas County. Um, I think that we had strong candidates that have a lot of good experience you know, being in the public sector and okay. having accountability. And then in Clackamas County, there was some values that didn't really, you know, an, uh, respect the right. fact that public servants are really honorable and they really try to invest as much as they can to serve the public. Okay. Well, look, we, we, hey, you got to come back on now. Now we need that. As you were saying before, when you talked to me, you said, Bruce, I need an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to, but we want to thank you very much for thank your you involvement. Bruce. And hopefully there's some folks out there that, that will take uh, take the, the challenge, if you will, right. and get involved. Very, very important. And young folks like yourself, I mean, we really appreciate the fact that you're involved. Uh, I take my hand off to you and I support you. Thank so, you, Bruce. Okay, good. Folks, look, we're, we're here at this point, Bob. That's uh, it. That's it? Okay, good. Hey, thanks very much, folks, for joining us. Join us next week. We'll have another good show. And, and as uh, I was going to say, George, George again. George that's right. Please. Back to what you believe in. Right. Have a good one, folks. God bless America, too. Get and, involved. And remember Veterans Day. Thanks mm -hmm. for serving guys that are out there, okay, across the board. Okay? Take care. Bye. We're clear.